going to start with Dr. Stephen Mursky, uh, USDA, uh, ARS, Beltsville, and we're going to do 20-minute sessions and then Q&A at the end. So basically, we're going to, you know, so hold your questions and all three of our uh, speakers will be up and able to field any question at the end. So we're going to break it down that way. So. I'm going to kind of give a, a, a brief overview of establishment methods and strategies uh, and then the conversation is going to get continuously more focused so I'm going to kind of introduce a, a, a spread of them and then uh, uh, Greg is going to come in and talk a little bit more of, about a specific approach that we're having a lot of success with. A lot of the slides I have are a continuation actually of what Rob Myers was mentioning earlier today when he gave the uh, uh, opening address where it was talking about Establishment methods being one of the biggest uh, driving factors to why folks are or folks are not adopting cover crops. So you can see in both of these surveys, this is a survey that we put together through Cornell, uh, both organic and conventional producers. And here is um, as the one that one of the one of the many surveys that Rob did. I think this was actually the non-cover crop users, and I, I should have specified that. I've used this slide for multiple purposes, so I didn't have that in there here for this. But generally, the point is is that that establishment small windows of opportunity and timing, uh, wet conditions really impede the ability to get cover crops in the system. So I'm gonna talk about uh, establishment methods, a little bit about species specific responses, and then highlight some of the north to south dynamics that go on in the northeast. And I, I don't wanna just highlight establishment methods. While I think it is probably one of the biggest uh, factors affecting adoption of cover crops, and again, remember we're only at one and a half percent. I know in Maryland it feels like everybody's cover cropping, uh, but it's, it's just not the case in the country, right? And so certainly establishment is a big one, no question. But the, the germplasm, what we have available, and the quality of that germplasm is also limiting the performance, which can affect folks' interests in, in, in adopting cover crops because of the limitations. Obviously the biggest is once you do establish a cover crop is, oh, that's loud, is the variability in its performance. And so all sorts of factors go into that variability of performance, and I'll talk about that in a second. But, uh, and then information on management. There's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of generalizing information across the country. Uh, cover crops are a biological tool. So they're going to be very site specific in their performance, and we need to manage them accordingly. And so when I just said variability in performance, I mean, it's clear that just like any plant that we have in the landscape that we manage, it responds to all the factors that go into growth and development. So the, how we establish that cover crop, the timing in which it's growing, the conditions it's growing under, and then how we terminate those cover crops all affects the way that cover crop performs. Fortunately, there are some early innovators. There's some progress being made with establishment uh, approaches to getting cover crops into the system. Uh, and I'll, I'll highlight a few of those and you can see by some of these images here, some of the strategies folks are using to get cover crops into the system. So post-harvest drilling is obviously uh, what most folks are familiar with. It's not working for most of us, right? Because we don't have a lot of time after the corn comes out of the field or soybean comes out of the field to have a drill go through that field and have the cover crop do very much. So while this is certainly the most precise strategy for getting seed in the ground at a consistent depth and get uniform emergence and you have a lot of control over your seeding rates, uh, this, this method is largely a, a challenge for producers across the country, except when they have windows after uh, silage or, or small grains where they have more, more timing to be able to get those cover crops established. So that's why there's been so much emphasis on interseeding. And there's a lot of different strategies to interceding, and you've already seen many of them today. So, you know, Rob already stole all of my thunder in my talk. <laughs> so let's just review. Interceding is not new. This has been going on for a long time. Folks have come up with strategies to get cover crops into their systems for a long time. Now, uh, cover crops have gone out of vogue since the, the, the certainly since the, the chemical heyday, and, and, and we have a lot of other, you know, precise nutrient and weed management tools, and so cover crops were not in uh, vogue for a long time now. Uh, but it's not a new strategy, and it's even continued into the 90s. You can see folks are still doing these kinds of these practices. But the technology has no question improved. There's a lot better technology out there. So let's review some of that. This is a, a common strategy all across the country, uh, in particular regions where they have a lot of these kinds of small planes and runways. Uh, this, for example, where we are in Maryland, the Eastern Shore, it's a common practice to fly on seed. 
Um, and so here you can see aerial seeding going into a soybean field and it's common to do that as the soybean is about to drop its leaves so that the seeds kind of work its way down, the leaves fall on top, you get a little bit of uh, mulching effect from those leaves and get, and get establishment. But again, this is contingent on having good moisture. If they don't have good moisture, then they don't get a good take because those seeds are just sitting naked on that soil surface. So a step forward to try to get more soil and seed contact, that's the big thing with the germination and emergence, the uniform germination emergence happens when you have better seed to soil contact, that you get better hydration of the seeds, longer duration of ambition of the water into the seed, and so that's why you get that better germination. So folks are still looking for fast strategies to get that seed down, so uh, uh, broadcasting that seed all over the surface, uh, whether you're doing it when there's a living cash crop growing or, or, or beyond, uh, this is uh, a strategy to, to get that seed in there, and here they're following behind and lightly abrading the surface of the soil to get that to take. A, a lot of folks in our region where they do have a little bit more time, they'll spin on seed and then run through the field with a turbo till, and that's a common strategy for getting cover crops established. But, but these spinning seed on into living uh, cash crops are limited and wh when you can get into the field, and also your dop you can often put a lot of seed into the whirl of the plant, and so it's limiting that precision, and so hence the birth of some of these types of technology uh, where you're avoiding dropping that seed in the canopy, um, and there's been a lot of improvements on this. And so this is, Rob mentioned this earlier, this Hagee technology, this is certainly very impressive, and this is uh, the kinds of equipment that's going to escalate adoption because it's going to be able to cover massive landscapes uh, fast and, and, and efficiently. And, and here uh, we even have, uh, and I don't know if Charlie's in the room right now, is he in the room? No, okay, but we have even custom operators who are working, and for example, in Pennsylvania, who are for, who are seeding for uh, growers in the region. And this is just this is Charlie's operation here, and he he custom designed this high boy in this system. But again, in this case, we're still dropping seed on the soil surface. We're still putting that naked seed on the soil surface, uh, and so it's it's contingent a lot on the moisture conditions at the time you put it out there. Uh, and and I, I guess I'm just highlighting some other examples here. So this is a New York farmer. This is an article in the New uh, this New York farmer. It's an article in No-Till Farmer, and and where you modified fertilizer applicators to to deliver seed and to, uh, for cover crops in their system. There's even robotic techno uh, technology. I saw this at Steve Groff's field day. I don't know if Steve's in the room. Uh, a number of years ago. I don't know where the progress is with this technology, but this is, I, I think many of us think this is pretty much what's coming, right? We're going to have little robots driving around our fields and picking our weeds and delivering our seeds and our fertilizers and they're gonna be geo-referenced and, and they're gonna be driving all night long while we're sleeping. So other strategies to improving that seed to soil contact, this links to the other slides I showed earlier, this is more of a labile cultivation, so in more tillage based systems, you can deliver seed and then cultivate that seed in. These are just all different strategies of trying to get that seed to soil contact. Uh, and uh, the birth of the, the Penn State three-way interseeder came a, a number of years ago. Um, and this is a really exciting uh, technology because it's, it's using what we know, it's a drill. That's all it is. Some of the early pro prototypes was more roughing it in, but now we're, we're looking at a piece of technology that is drilling seed between corn or soybean rows, and all you're looking at is, is the, the gangs where the corn rows or soybean rows would go were removed. And so this is something we know. We know about depth wheels, we know about coulters and, and how to do that in a system, and so when it's working well, and this is what it looks uh, um, Here's just another example of another company's product that's also trying to develop this technology is Dawn. And so you can see their approach is a two row system versus the three row with the Penn State. All my experience has been collaborating with Penn State and, and researching the Penn State interceder, which is working well. It does have some challenges, uh, but, it, but it, it works really well, uh, and particularly as you go further north. And um, what we see is that, that we get this kind of emergence. This is beautiful, right? These three strips of cover crops, they're looking great, they're well established. Uh, but, but the challenge is, is that these cover crops have to hang out there under pretty low light conditions, often very dry conditions, and it's a really inhospitable environment. Um, some species are better adapted to that. We find like some shade tolerant species like red clovers and, and even crimson clover, uh, annual rye grass tends to work really well. Um, Greg is going to give an entire talk on this, so I don't want to steal his uh, presentation. But the point is, is that, that while this is working, we do have some challenges to work out. 
we have, when we have, particularly when you have high corn yields, you dump a lot of stover just right on top of those cover crops. And so a lot of my experience has been that the fields can be quite patchy. You can have really nice establishment and you can have low establishment. And where you have this you know, collecting of, of that corn stover on top of those covers, you can have really big spots in the field where you have no covers. But this is an, a, an exciting development. It's not working as well in soybeans. It's working better in corn. Again, I'll let Greg talk about that, especially down south where we have very hot conditions. We canopy really fast. So these covers don't have a very long time to grow. We cover fast and we cover completely. As you go further north, that's less of an issue and they're experiencing more success. Just some fields to look at where in the, the more successful applications of the interseeder. And obviously, the, the advantage of having some forage in the fields is, is very attractive once you can get some established that early. Establishment method trial. So this is something, uh, w when we got the Penn State Interceder about a year after uh, working uh, with Penn State on this, we established uh, the establishment uh, methods trial, which is uh, looking at aerial seeding, which we're just simulating an aerial seeder by using a high boy and spinning seed on, uh, versus a uh, post-harvest drill application versus the, the Penn State Interceder. Um, and uh, we have a number of years of data, but this is only the year I'm going to highlight for you. Just to, you're, you're going you're to come out tomorrow to Bark, and you're going to see a lot of my experiments, and you're going to see this establishment trial, and Greg's going to be talking in, in, in with Steve Groff in front of those trials, and you'll get a chance to walk through there. And this year's results are a bit different than, than the previous years. So here you're looking at the, the fall biomass and the spring biomass of cereal rye, annual ryegrass, the legume mix, which is red cro clover, crimson clover, and hairy vetch, and then this annual ryegrass legume mixture. And what really stands out, as I'm sure you can see, is that the aerial application, so I don't know where my legend is. It's gone. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> sorry, everybody. Uh, the gray is your post-harvest drilling, and the blue is the interseeder, and the uh, orange is the aerial seeding. So you can see that clearly both in the fall and in the spring in this particular year uh, aerial seeding or post or, or interseeding worked really well getting that seed in early that it was a colder than average uh, climate year and so we didn't get very good take on our post harvest drill cover crops they got drilled late they didn't do very much they just hung out there um, and and so we didn't get nearly the performance that we did the aerial interseeding you're going to go out and see the field site tomorrow and you're going to tell me that I was lying to you. Well, we had a really mild fall and we had a really mild spring. And so our drilled cover crops look absolutely stunning. They probably just look just, just as good, if not better, in some of the plots. So this is a moving target. This is a challenge. There is a lot of bugs to work out with establishing covers. I'm excited to be part of teams that are doing this. I'm excited to be around people like Greg and, and the other folks at, at Penn State who are, who are developing these technologies. We've got a lot to learn. There's a lot of adaption to, that needs to happen, but, but we're making progress. And I don't think that this is a, a, an if, I think it's a when type scenario when it comes to getting covers into the system. In fact, one of the, the applications I'm personally really excited about is, is the application of putting this interseeder into double crop soybeans. So I know this is the Northeast, uh, you know, uh, SARE uh, professional development uh, meeting where most folks are north of Lancaster, probably. But as you start to get south of Lancaster, many uh, people have double crop soybeans in their rotation. We have double crop soybeans where we are. It's very prominent. And what we find is if we can take the double crop beans and not plant them on a 15 inch, row, 15 inch row spacing, which is common in our region, and we put in at a 30 inch row spacing, we can intercede that cover crop. And so yeah, we may take a yield penalty. We're gonna test that over time, how much of a yield penalty we take. But I've never, ever, ever seen cover crops look like this. I took this picture three or four days ago. You'll come and see these plots uh, tomorrow. But I've never seen this kind of cover crop growth in, the, in this, this early in the spring. And that's because we put that seed out in, in whatever, sometime in August, I'd have to recall, i see you guys next. But this is interseeded between soybeans. We harvested the soybeans, and this is a mixture of annual ryegrass, cereal rye, crimson clover, red clover. It's working really well. Another system that I'm, I'm particularly excited about is, um, is this frost-seeded system with red clover. So that's been working really well. I think for most folks who are coming from the Northeast who have experience with cover crops, must either know a farmer or are working with farmers or are a farmer who have done some frost drilling of red clover into their winter wheat. Um, it works well. 
Um, we've been doing a slight modification of that, and I, I kind of like how this, where this is going. Uh, we drill that red clover into uh, the wheat instead of frost and seed it. So we don't spin it on and broadcast it. We just scratch it in the ground when it's frozen. We go through the snow or, or when the ground has a strong frost on it, and we just scratch it in the surface, and we find that that gives us a good uniform stand. And then what I've been doing is coming in in the fall and drilling cereal rye into that red clover. And look at that. I mean, that's a really nice grass legume mixture. This will target a lot of the fertility needs we have while also addressing some of the weed management issues that we're certainly concerned with as herbicide resistance becomes more and more of an issue up north. Species specific relationships. Post harvest drilling, that's a method that we're all very familiar with. Um, it works well for all species. Establishment and survivorship is a challenge because of the late timing. And when you can get in there after a small grain or if you have silage in the rotation, when there's bigger windows to come in at a, at a, at a better uh, climate time, then you're gonna get great establishment and it's not really uh, concerned what species you're gonna be using. Uh, but if you're gonna be post harvest uh, broadcast applications, so spinning on the seed, and, and then uh, leaving it there, uh, you're gonna get a much better take if you have some kind of a turbo till or some kind of a, a surface scratching of the soil to get better seed to soil contact. But uh, again, if you do get that soil disturbance in there, you tend not to have to be too concerned about which species you're, you're working with. Uh, and in the case of interseeding, when you surface apply, which is these high boys we were looking at or, these, some of, um, or, or the aerial seeding applications, that is somewhat species specific. Red clover, crimson clover, annual ryegrass, forage radish, those tend to work much better. The small seeded uh, um, uh, broadleaves work really well in that application as well as uh, the annual ryegrass. But if you're going to be able to get good to seed to soil contact, like you can with the inner seeder, um, the, I mean the, the, the Penn State inner seeder or the Dawn ap uh, application, uh, you have more flexibility, but still some of the main cover crops work because there you're dealing with that shade tolerance still. So you're not just dealing with getting that cover crop in, but you're also dealing with these shade tolerance conditions. And I think this shade tolerance, as I said, is less of an issue as you go from south to north. The further north you go, the canopying, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the speed in which that canopying occurs is, is slower. And so that cover, has, cover crop has more time to photosynthate and, and store those sugars. And then obviously frost seeding here at the bottom. In full disclosure, that uh, as part of the interseeder development, we started a little company called Interseeder Technologies, and I have a financial interest in that company. So uh, uh, you'll see some of that in here, but most of what I'm talking about is data and research and demonstration that we've done at, uh, at Penn State. Part of my job, mostly in our team, has been to do uh, work on farms with farmers. I've gotten a little bit less involved in the actual research and uh, a lot of the input I've gotten from farmers and folks like you has helped us make revisions to the machine and kind of improve it over time. Uh, and uh, I've actually done research. I do tons of research. I've done it my whole career. But it's been really enlightening that if you really want to fast track something, uh, and you guys in industry know this, get it out, do it, start doing it, get a lot of feedback, and uh, uh, you learn very quickly about uh, what works and what doesn't work. Uh, so we started in, back in 2010, and um, basically the idea, and you've heard this all uh, before, seed cover crops early like V4 to V6, do it at the end of the critical weed free period. It's actually, uh, like Stephen said, it was a practice used in the Northeast uh, years back, but also it's been used in Europe. It's uh, there's papers in Brazil where people have are doing this now, and uh, also our friends up in Quebec uh, have are much more successful. Conference up in Ontario, a guy stood up and said, "I sold 30,000 acres worth of ryegrass uh, last year in Ontario and Quebec." So those guys are doing interseeding, and then also. Uh, out in the Pacific Northwest in British Columbia in those areas where they have dairy and water quality issues uh, uh, they've done a lot of this in the past so we were kind of building on some of their ideas and and they've generally uh, kind of shown that you can do this and not really impact corn yields a lot of farmers are worried about uh, that issue we tried to come up with a, a vision of not just doing a cover crop but trying to accomplish a lot of other things, 
as part of this. Uh, maybe combine it with another trip, like side dressing or spring uh, glyphosate. Uh, maybe an opportunity to reduce seed rates from what we have to do with broadcasting to get a good stand. Uh, try, and try to make it multifunctional so you could use it on other crops. If you want to drill barley in the fall, you could do that. Make it adaptable to no-till. Some of the systems Stephen showed are not uh, going to penetrate the hard Maryland ground in June or in Pennsylvania, uh, but, but uh, the newer systems will. Make it transportable so you could hook a pickup to it and drive it down the road 55 miles an hour. Uh, make it adaptable to smaller tractors. Uh, try to do something that's going to boost their corn yield in the long term. By, uh, I say, I, the sort of line I have is next year when we go into that field, like Stephen showed with the grass growing in it, the corn's going to think it's going into a hay field, not into an old corn field, you know. Uh, and, uh, and we know that usually has a 10, 15 bushel boost uh, from all the good things that the hay rotation does. And then we, increasingly important is protect the soil and reduce runoff and scavenge some nutrients, um, and then figure out how all this can generate a positive economic return. And so that's, that's our vision, and we're working towards making sure we can accomplish all of those things. So I've done field days uh, with farmers to introduce them. This is out in western Pennsylvania, nice straight flat fields. And uh, I just did simple ryegrass uh, in June, rained as we were finishing up the plot there. Ryegrass came up. We had a low residual herbicide program, uh, and we got a great stand. Uh, the only problem here was I was driving the tractor, and my county agent friend Joel Hunter was at the end right here where I'm standing, and I was coming back, and I'm not usually a good tractor driver, and Joel waved at me or something like, you're doing good. I thought he meant move over a little bit. So right at the front of the plot, I shifted over a little bit, and I took out about 30 feet of corn. Uh, the one place you did, I could have run over corn anywhere else in that field, nobody would have seen it, but right in the front there was the wrong place. Surprisingly, running over corn hasn't been that big of an issue for us. So our, our, we'll see this tomorrow, um, and you've seen some of this, but uh, some, of the, some of the components that we've added over time is uh, uh, the drill units, uh, uh, some units come with the opportunity to uh, squirt nitrogen right next to the row. It's kind of similar to that wide drop uh, applicator some of you might be familiar with. Uh, you could uh, rig it up to apply glyphosate under the corn canopy. In the back we added those assist wheels that, that allow you to use a lower, uh, a little smaller tractor. We added a ground drive in the back to make uh, uh, the delivery of seed easier. We added a loading platform on the back, and some uh, of our customers have asked for other drill units so you could put the other drill units in, and then you have a 10 or 15 foot uh, drill, and some of them have a hitch for towing uh, that I talked about earlier, and that's good for conservation district type uh, folks. <laughs> Here's a close up of the uh, nitrogen squirting on. Um, and uh, another thing we've noticed is if we go into a cornfield with stover, um, these, units, these units handle that stover pretty well also. Uh, another reason I like the drill unit concept in, the, in some of the newer interseeders is that, like Stephen mentioned, it is a struggle uh, for those young plants to get up and go when we have uh, hot, dry conditions. Uh, everything works in a year where it rains eight inches in June, but uh, te true test is where it rains it it rains two inches or inch and a half. Uh, and <clears throat> I notice when you get a light June shower and go back out in the fields uh, where we have the where we have the uh, drilled uh, cover crops, you can see the soil still wet right there down through the row. It stays that way for a. a uh, a day or so maybe after a, a thunderstorm or whatever. So that helps boost the uh, uh, vigor of, I think it's a positive factor. There's a number of other ones too. Better seed to soil contact, better seed depth uh, control. 
uh, uh, better placement below with the herbicide treated uh, soil surface and, and others. But I wanted to point that out to you. So some of, here's some of the uh, uh, examples of things we did in 2015, I believe. Uh, here's one uh, Bill and his team have done. Uh, organic is a great fit. These guys are beating the soil a lot. They love to have legumes in there to make nitrogen. They don't have, uh, they don't have a lot of residual herbicides, and they're usually not growing 300 bushel corn. Uh, these guys were growing about 200 bushel in Lancaster County, and uh, with, our la with our great fall last year, we got a great catch of ryegrass and radish, and uh, that's uh, gonna be a, a great place to grow some organic crop this year, <coughs> as uh, uh, we got a great catch there. Uh, another one I did, uh, grow, as many of you know, we do a lot of double cropping with triticale, then that corn is late in the fall. It could be late in the fall. So in, uh, in this field in Blair County up in central Pennsylvania, Dave Wilson and I worked together and uh, uh, he had several mixes for us. It had <coughs> basically uh, radish, clover, and some brassicas and they tended to work well. Uh, we did have some other plots with small grains. They tend not to work well as interseeded uh, uh, crops. This is an example of fields that have uh, consistent manure applications, have good soil nitrates late in the season, and uh, they really foster good ryegrass growth and other non-legume growth, so it's a good match. A lot of these fields get a coating of manure anyway right when the silage is harvested, so the cover crops really take off. Some grain fields, it's not that way. Soil nitrate levels in Pennsylvania, Maryland can be quite low after a high yielding crop, and then your cover crop's gonna struggle a little bit. That's where the clovers in a mix, or the whole idea, I think having a mix, like Mitch talked about earlier, that's where the clovers would tend to proliferate in that low nitrogen environment. There's some places where it, it, the system just really works. This is uh, Bob Buell's place up in Erie County, and you just don't grow cover crops too well up there in Erie, short season, uh, harvesting corn in October and November. <coughs> and Bob has uh, um, I've done plots with Bob for three years. He actually purchased a machine now, and he's, he's doing better than we were. Uh, and he's got a fantastic stand of uh, clover and ryegrass. Bob's, one thing Bob's taught us is adapt the, and we heard earlier, adapt the cover crops to your individual situation. I was going with 10 to 15 to 20 pounds of ryegrass. Bob came back and said, Greg, that's, that's way too much for our situation. We're getting way too, we want to get more clover. So he, his mix he came up with was six pounds of ryegrass, six pounds of clover, and a pound of radish. And that seems to be uh, working for him. The other interesting thing, if you can come to the field day, I have a whole list of alternative ideas that we've come up with. This is one example. A guy called us up from Oklahoma. He says, we grow uh, cotton, uh, irrigated cotton, and then we graze cattle on those uh, fields afterwards. Uh, and uh, love to get my wheat on wheat. They graze the cattle on wheat. Love to get the wheat started a little earlier. I found your machine. Love to get one. So we scrambled and we got them a six row, we shipped it out there and they had a field day and they did like 1,100 acres in this machine and uh, they got a really good uh, early start on their wheat and got a lot more grazing than they would have otherwise waiting for that uh, cotton to be harvested. So uh, it'll be interesting to see where that one goes. Uh, out in Wisconsin, these guys were interested in doing a demonstration, kind of a conservation district right near Green Bay. What we're finding is there's a lot of areas that are starting to take uh, water quality seriously. Uh, Green Bay is one, Western Ohio is another, uh, uh, parts of Iowa, and uh, these guys took a, uh, in, a two row interceder out and went to town with it and uh, got tremendous uh, uh, clover uh, catch out there. And uh, they're going back in a bigger way this year with more demonstrations. Uh, another northern site, the guy up in Minnesota, a, cu a couple guys in Minnesota have machines and they're having more success with uh, 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 soybeans up there. Uh, maybe they're not growing 70 bushel soybeans. It's a cool climate. 
and uh, one of the guys is organic and he's made a fundamental change to a soybean production going to 40 inch rows I'm sure he grows pretty uh, decent soybeans and gets some good returns on 40 inches but he gets a heck of a, a cover crop stand so one concept is that in some situations you might need to make changes to the fundamental uh, crop management another guy in South Dakota has one and he uh, uh, he was really interested in having green cover uh, with living roots and he, ha he uh, sends us pictures where cover crops go off into the horizon uh, different machines that we have are two row uh, four row uh, six row and this year we'll start we've uh, also have the 12 row option now uh, available I've got a bunch of data here that uh, I won't get into we haven't found yield responses we're looking at earlier interseeding to try to boost uh, uh, yields under stressful conditions and uh, uh, and also to try to boost our biomass in the fall uh, and we had a good trial this year uh, Matt did a trial Matt Ryan and found uh, that uh, we're seeing some yield boosts in the second year where you go back and plant corn back into fields he was getting like a five to ten bushel uh, yield response depending on the nitrogen level that he used another one I did with Heather Darby is I started to look at soil nitrates in the fall and uh, uh, between Heather and I, we've averaged about a 40% reduction in soil nitrates where we get a catch of the uh, uh, ryegrass. So that's, that's kind of important. Canadians have found some re uh, reductions in phosphorus movement off their sites in British Columbia. Uh, and a take home message is that I think the management needs to be site specific. If you're in these stressful areas like southern Pennsylvania Maryland we may need to make significant changes to the basic crop management uh, other areas we don't need to do anything um, but uh, there's the timing there's species generally ryegrass clover radish are their three go-to ones um, uh, we have uh, information on herbicide management some farmers are looking at variety selection earlier hybrids tend to be better than others some of our customers say upright leaf hybrids um, might have an advantage and then another one we've seen is that nitrogen supply uh, in the soil so I'll be around to talk more about the details share with you some resources and some ideas for demonstrations if you're interested in pursuing something like this uh, at the field day we have tomorrow so I'm gonna cut it off there and turn it over to my colleague Sir Diker um, and uh, at the end, maybe we can have a discussion and field some questions about it. All right, now we'll get our trifecta on to establishing and uh, with the cover crops, and, and Shford Diker will uh, take our last leg of it, and then yeah. we'll take our questions after that. Thank you. I'm uh, very glad to be here. It was just great to come in here and drive into Maryland and see the beautiful flowers, and I was thinking, oh, I missed cherry blossom season again. I wanted to visit Washington, D.C. once and see the cherry blossom, but I guess I'm too late again. But I'm looking forward to seeing those in uh, Pennsylvania. So I was asked to talk a little bit about cash crop establishment into or after cover crops. Uh, first, I, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, no-till versus tillage. And so I don't know if any of you know me, but I'm a big proponent of no tillage. We have really worked hard in promoting no tillage in Pennsylvania over the years. And um, no till represents now about um, 65, 70 percent of the planted acres in our state, where it was 20 percent in 2000. And um, that is for a reason. We try to really emphasize the no till system, but uh, these are some of the benefits that we see reduced sheet erosion if you till the soil there is really a lot of opportunity for sheet erosion reduced gully erosion as well because if that runoff from that bare soil starts to collect in a certain area in the landscape it's it can easily form a gully uh, this was next to Steve Groff's farm um, no-till is also a great way to conserve water you get higher uh, infiltration as we see here this one here, you see the crusted up soil, the, the ceiling that happens when the raindrops hit the bare soil surface. 
uh, after a few heavy rainstorms, we get this kind of a situation in a intensively tilled soil and that, that water just doesn't go in anymore. Well, if we have the soil protected by the crop residue, that water has a place to go. Works mostly uh, well in the summer when the soil is relatively dry. In the, in the spring or in the winter when you, the soil might be frozen or the soil is full with water, that doesn't, um, that difference is small, but in, in the, especially in the summer, we take more water in. Um, less evaporation, because that mulch really helps to reduce evaporation from the soil surface. This is some data from, from Kentucky. Um, here you see the uh, evaporation losses, two and a half inches here in early summer, or, uh, and then um, still higher than in no-till. So this is, here was one year, 2006, uh, the tillage study that I have, and you could just see in July the, the, this water stress in the conventional tillage compared to no tillage. Um, the better organic matter content at the soil surface, here you can see how, and that is where the organic matter counts is in my book, is near the soil surface. We don't need organic matter 10 inches deep. We need it really close to the soil surface. And you see here, this is long-term no-till versus conventional <coughs> tillage, tillage study that has been going on for a few decades. Uh, and then that helps to improve the soil structure. You see here, uh, this is unfortunately on our horticulture farm, I think. Uh, we see a lot of this, ground up soil, and it's pulverized and it becomes structureless, basically. And here, compare that to something like this. This is a farmer I work with. He uses no tillage and also um, he integrates that with his grazing operation. We get higher biological activity in low, long term no tillage. For example, if we take earthworms, here we see some earthworm uh, numbers compared in different studies in Indiana. Typically, two times as many earthworms in no tillage as in plowed fields. You see uh, also crop rotation and other management uh, also have a big effect, sometimes bigger than the tillage. But nonetheless, there is the difference between the tillage systems. Labor savings. Uh, here, this lady was doing some tillage here in the soil. She was just sweating bullets. But I was there having a relaxed time. <laughs> and, and then, you know what? No tillage is really where I find the cover crops really come together with no tillage. <clears throat> we can get a much better results. Um, here is an example. This is, of course, from Brazil. I don't have a pointer. Is this a pointer? Yeah, okay, I can use this one. Oh, sorry. This uh, mouse is not very handy. Okay, so here we see, just to illustrate, these guys are harvesting with the combines, the grain or whatever it is. It might be cotton. But here they are drilling the next crop or the cover crop five seconds after harvest. Of course, you can never do that when you have to till the soil in between. And you have to wait till the right conditions and you, you lose usually a few weeks. So we can get faster establishment of cover crops. And then we can also have more time in the spring to terminate those cover crops because if we use tillage, we typically have to terminate that cover crop a few weeks before we start planting. And we can never do something like this. So we have the opportunity to let those cover crops develop more growth in the spring. Another thing is that it is very difficult to manage a big cover crop like this with tillage. You try to plow this under, it will be a big, big mess. Uh, so with no-till, we now find ways to manage this residue, put it on the soil surface, get that biomass maximized, and then that helps to improve the, the soil. So those are some reasons for um, really combining no tillage with cover crops. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about a few keys to making it successful. When we talk about no till, we're really talking about starting at harvest. We start no tilling at the harvest of the previous crop. You have to make sure that that crop residue of the previous harvest is really distributed uniformly. This is only soybean residue and they, they planted soybeans in this crop plant field again. But you can see the poor establishment because the crop residue from that previous soybean crop was so unevenly distributed and clumped up. And therefore, it was very hard to establish that, that next crop. And in this case, 
I think they use a drill, and the drills especially are very sensitive to this, and uh, you get easily, you cannot get any seed to soil contact where we have these large bunches of residue. Here we have an example of how that looks, and I'm seeing a lot of these kinds of examples in Pennsylvania when I drive through the fields. Here we see the, the combine, of course, ran here, and here there's no residue, and here there is big amounts of residue, so this is totally uneven distributed. This was actually on our own research farm, and I said, okay, if we ever have, want to have success with no tillage, we need to address this. This is only soybean residue, which is a low residue crop. To imagine how that looks after corn. So here we have big bunches of residue where if you want to plant into this, it's going to be a big challenge. Uh, so what we had, we looked at our combine and we found, okay, this was the residue distribution we had. We had a bat spreader and these bats, these were broken off, parts of it. They were also, these edges were all rounded. And so we discovered, okay, that is not uh, how these bats should look. There was also another thing. We looked underneath, inside, and there you find that the large pieces of residue fall out here onto the bed spreader. But here we have the chaff. The fine chaff comes out here, never had, hits that bed spreader. So that chaff that comes out will never get distributed. So we refurbished our combine and we put on new beds here on our bed spreader. And we bought an, an aftermarket attached uh, uh, a chaff spreader that you can run with the hydraulics and this chaff spreader now was spreading the chaff and this one was spreading the uh, larger residue. So now we got this kind of an effect and the residue is now evenly distributed in a blanket the way you like it to have it. We still had some issues sometimes with the combine operator he stopped many times for whatever reason if he saw a little like groundhog or something, I think, he stopped <laughs> and he didn't want to kill the groundhog. So then there was a little bunch of residue left, so you'd kind of want to go straight forward. But uh, here's another example how that would, m would look then. If you don't have good residue distribution, this was supposed to be a solid field of sorghum sudan grass after barley, but here the barley residue was all clumped up in these, uh, <coughs> in these uh, areas here behind the combine no sorghum sudan grass there and the barley, volunteer barley came up. So that was uh, residue distribution. Now a few planting issues, um, planters versus drills. So if we look at planters, they typically have um, better residue flow through the machine because uh, those units are wider spaced. You have more options for residue handling attachments so you have uh, row cleaners, you have um, uh, coulter options, you have more space to put that on the machine. Uh, there is more down pressure per opener possible because you have fewer units per, per running per, per foot of width and therefore you can have more down pressure per each individual unit. You also have, um, yeah, that is important to get penetration into the soil. And then fertilizer and pesticide handling capacities you have on planters, which typically you don't have on drills. You have better seed depth control because the uh, depth wheel is next to the, the double disc openers instead of um, usually the depth control is behind the opener on many drills. You get better seed metering, better uh, singulation, so that can help in reducing the, the seeding rates and getting more equals uh, even spacing between the seeds. However, the planters are usually more expensive than drills um, and they also handle fewer seed sizes. Often the planters are only made to handle a few seed sizes, so that's why we still often use drills. Um, very important for when we look at either planters or drills is with no tillage to have enough weight on the planter. So here we had a, a case where we, we were experimenting with putting some more uh, coulters on the planter. We wanted to do zone tillage. Um, I didn't, that was my first experience with that. So we put three extra coulters on each unit, uh, but we didn't increase the weight on the planter. So 
So we've started running this planter and we saw, oh, there might be some issues. So we set these coulters a little bit deeper. We thought that was the issue and then we just went. And lo and behold, there were whole patches in the field. There was no seed placed in the soil. Then we were discovering that this planter was just riding on those coulters because we had added so much iron to push into the soil that without the extra weight on that planter, that would not, not, uh, this, not work. So this is very important and sometimes you don't see it when you are first working with that. So here are a few, um, few tips from something uh, our former research station manager at Landisville, he worked on making the planter there uh, better suited for no tillage. He wanted to really convert the whole uh, research farm to no-till except where researchers were asking for tillage. He had a f inherited a four-row white a planter, pool type, with uh, soybean with splitters, uh, seven rows. Uh, it was uh, equipped with liquid side dress and uh, he converted that at a certain time. This was how that first looked. And here you see some of the parts of a no-till planter. Here was a, a coulter, but this was a very worn uh, bubble coulter. And a bubble coulter is really not something that we recommend for no-till. It's because it creates a lot of, or it can create a lot of sidewall compaction when you go into soil that is a little bit suboptimal in moisture. Uh, here was a depth control wheel that had, uh, was conventional. Um, there was no seat firmer here and it had this one had rubber closing wheels so he redid this and this is how it looked after he he fixed that up I show this because you can often use your existing equipment and refurbish it and then you don't have to use com or buy completely new equipment so here he put on a residue manager uh, that has row cleaners and a, a fluted 13 wave coulter um, this one is unit mounted, so you get better tracking of the depth with your double disc opener. This coulter should really not run any deeper than your double disc opener. He put on uh, these dimpled depth wheels, depth gauge wheels, where you have a little dimple here so you don't get compaction right next to that double disc opener. He put on seat firmer, so that seat firmer works to push that seed to the bottom of that seed trench so you get uniform seed depth placement and then he also put on a, a spite closing wheel next to a rubber uh, uh, closing wheel and a drag chain just to push some crumbles into the, the seed furrow if that was still a little bit open. So this was just uh, a way of, of setting up the planter for better no-till performance. Uh, with drills, we have other things. Um, we don't have that many options often to, to change the setup on the drill, but um, it's very important to calibrate the drill. Drill is basically controlled spillage, roughly. Uh, <laughs> you just, the, the, the flutes, they just push out those seeds, and it is important there's a seed rate usually specified on the drill but it is important to check that because uh, that might not be actually what you are planting because the seeds that you are purchasing might be different size than the ones that 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 they use for that calibration uh, the depth control is important that on drills many small seeded crops especially they are very sensitive to being placed too deep so that is um, a major issue with planting small seeded crops. If you plant them too deep, they will probably not emerge. Um, the press wheels, selection of press wheels for seed to soil contact is important to get that seed slot um, closed and to get, or sometimes just to push those little tiny seeds just a little bit into the soil. And always read the manual for, um, but over time, settings might change if, because your drill is wearing. Uh, here I have a few, um, few, few tips here. So the seeding depth is more critical than the rate. So when you use drills it is, and you have very small seeded crops, sometimes it is, in, it is very challenging when you have a lot of residue there, like corn stalks 
that might be very difficult to plant those. So typically, you, you have to look at your crop rotation. When am I going to plant these small seeded crops? Because um, it's very hard to plant, say, alfalfa after corn grain in no-till because of the, the stalks that affect the depth of placement. Uh, there are different types of, of openers on the drills, but that is really drill specific. You cannot really change that, but they have, when you select a drill, when you consider buying one, these are some, some uh, opportunities to think about things. These single type, single disc openers, like on the John Deere, they have uh, better residue handling capacity because you see these are very uh, far apart, these uh, rows, the gangs. And so residue tends to flow better through that machine. Also, you have um, only that one coulter instead of a, not a coulter, but a double disc, the, the, the disc opener. And it cuts the residue better than a double disc opener typically. Although on this one here, this is a, a Vermeer, you see this is a bit offset. So that's this disc on the double disc opener trails that one. And so that gives it a little bit better cutting ability than if you had two discs uh, right smack together at the beginning. And here also we have a, a depth control wheel that helps to control the depth of seeds uh, because it's right next to that disc. While here the depth control is with this press wheel that controls the depth as well. So if we have a bit of bumps in the field, then when you, what you measure there might actually not be where you want the depth to be for your double disc opener. So depth control sometimes is not as good with these drills as with these. However, when we have small seeded crops, um, here we have only one tube that feeds the seed between that opener and the soil. But here we have two seed tubes and there is a, a tube here for the small seed box and those seeds are dribbled a little bit behind so that basically they don't get dropped smack into the that um, V slot and then get pressed into the soil by the by that um, press wheel. So that tends to result a little bit better in, in small seeded crops. Finally, there is also shoot types, but we don't really have many of those. They have uh, limited residue handling ability. They and um, their depth control is limited and not very common. This is a shoe type uh, planter. We are gonna go into this. I wanted to just show you a little bit of the work on planting green that we are doing just to finish up. Planting green is a new technique that uh, we are doing a lot of work on now and our farmers are already starting to use it. It is to allow cover crops to put on more biomass to improve soil we see fewer hairpinning problems because when we go plant through that um, fresh uh, cover crop that is still green, <coughs> uh, we tend to push less of it into the seed slot and it cuts better. Uh, that is also that heavy <coughs> residue is um, useful to increase weed control, to save water in the summer, and also of much interest to us is to increase the natural enemies of insect pests. Um, we have the benefit of a, a farmer and vendor in, in Pennsylvania who developed this cover crop roller attachment that you can put on your planter. These, you, these roll the cover crop down. They have these row cleaners that are not fingered. They part the residue in front and then these rollers also, they tend to collect that residue in the centers of the row so that it goes away from the, the planted row. And then it is also made in sections so it follows the soil surface better than if you have one big solid bar. So we have been, um, well, this is just to illustrate what can happen if you have row cleaners that start to bail up your uh, hairy vetch. So you might not want to use the fingered row cleaners, that's why he has those discs tight. Just a few experiences just to round it off here this year. We planted green into hairy vetch. We had about, um, so here it is the benefit of waiting a little bit. This was only four days different, typical. We have more than that, but in four days we added 500 pounds of dry matter in the, on the hairy vetch. So that's the benefit of, of killing that um, hairy vetch later. 
Here's how it looks when we plant it into it. It was one ton of dry matter. This is the soil underneath. It's very nice and crumbly. This is long-term no-tillage. This is in our till plots. That's how that looks. This is chisel plowed, and you start to realize how much tillage you might have to do when you have a big cover crop like that. You also have to disc harrow it, do some more harrowing, which might not be so easy. You start to rake that up with that harrow. You got some implications. And this is then how that looked. This was our plowed field. We really start to experience the, the, the soil degradation on this long-term plowed field compared to planted green. This is the soil surface, uh, the plowed in cover crop, and this is planted green, 100% soil cover, very nice. This is at harvest, this is how the soil looks in the tilt field, and this is no-till planted green. Here you see night crawler casts, and these are all gathered by the night crawlers above their burrows, all these little pieces of straw, but you see most of it has been decomposed by the uh, biological activity. These were our yields from the corn. You see the lower yields on our intensive tillage. Well, the yields were the same in chiseled dist and uh, planted green. We used only 90 pounds of nitrogen fertilizer to get these yields, so we were very happy with that. Um, I have one more slide that I would like to show you. This is the interest in our natural predators. So we have an entomologist at Penn State who is interested in this and helps us. And here is the natural, the, the, the total predators in normal no tillage, where the cover crop was killed earlier, about two weeks before planting. And this is the number of natural enemies in, in planted green. This here puts some wax worms out there and we see larger, more uh, predation on the wax worms if we, um, oh, that is more predation here with planted green. This is still a work in progress. We just kind of basically started working on that this year. With that, I'm just going to close it because we need to have some question time. I have a question for Stephen and Greg. Um, any of you had uh, done interseeding when you have no-till rolled cover crop? Have you used the interseeder sometime and how it worked? I didn't see some results on that. If you have any input on this. Craig, I don't know if you've got a lot of experience with this. We've done just a little bit of it. I can't recall. I'm sure it worked, but I'm, and, uh, I'm coming from uh, organic systems, so we are not using any herbicide just in case anyone had used uh, the interseeder, I'm interested to see if we can incorporate it into organic systems. So, so I mean, we've done some of this. Uh, it's, it, I mean, you know, th these are just, this is a drill. I mean, it behaves just like any drill. So just like if you were gonna no-till drill uh, soybeans into, you know, your rye, roll down rye cover crop, uh, you have all the same sets of challenges of doing that. The only difference here is, is that that residue has been melting down and decomposing and softening uh, for quite some time. And so uh, generally it just depends on the biomass. If you've got a grass legume mixture, if you've got just a pure grass, if you're going into a heavy rolled rye soybean system, well that's going to be a different beast and that's going to be a bit more challenging. Uh, just because, you know, as that residue melts down, it becomes soft and it hairpins a little bit better and it's, it's harder to, to, to cut it. Uh, but if you have an rye batch mixtures, or if you're going into just a pure legume, then it's going to work fairly well. It's not. It's not going to be a problem. This is on interseeding. Any general herbicide uh, suggestions as far as residue for your annual rye, your brassicas, and so on that you're having success with, or you know what what e either both pre-emerge and or post-emerge herbicides can you be using and not damage your cover crop yeah my colleague bill curran and john wallace they're experts on this we've done three or four years worth of work on our website we have detailed recommendations but it goes something like this uh, a lot of herbicides work you don't want to use something like dual at a full rate that's death to grasses the other uh grass herbicides uh like uh, acetochlor uh, they're not quite as uh, bad on the ryegrass. It usually survives. 
There's other programs. The Canadians use something called Verdict, uh, and uh, it's a mixture of two herbicides, short residual. Uh, that uh, seems to work. I think it's maybe Outlook and Sharpen. Also, surprisingly, some of our old standby cheaper herbicide mixes like Atrazine and Prowl, many farmers use, uh, have, uh, have actually, uh, we've actually gotten fair uh, uh, catch in those two. So, um, in clovers, uh, Callisto is one that stands out as being death to clovers. So uh, uh, we want to avoid the, uh, what's the, I'm having a Lumax with that has the, that has dual and uh, Callisto in there. So surprisingly, if you, and then uh, in uh, herbicide resistant crops, if you can follow with a Roundup application at the time of interseeding, then you can, uh, then you can tend to clean up uh, any non Roundup resistant weeds. I guess if we have, uh, we, one of our plots we did in, first one we did in Lancaster County was in a field with mare's t Roundup resistant mare's tail. So, uh, uh, and depending on Roundup to clean up, Roundup resistant mare's tail was not that <laughs> successful. But uh, I think there could have been uh, some other options. Sharpen, which is a, a herbicide that's relatively short residual, is actually fairly effective on. Uh, young mare's tail as well. So we have a, a bunch. It's a little complicated, uh, but if you pay attention to details, I think it can make it work. And there's a number of weed scientists that are kind of uh, working on this. So, um, yeah, Greg, you had talked about you had that one slide where you talked about the 40% reduction in nitrates when you all planted or interceded the rye, the ryegrass. Could you just go into more detail about um, when that was planted and when it was terminated and, and all that jazz? Uh, all those fields were planted about the end of June. The question was, what was the uh, uh, soil nitrate data and how did we arrive at it? And those would be, those would probably be mostly on dairy farms uh, where we planted on, on the, at the, at the end of June or the first week of July. We got good establishment, it survived all year. And then we got decent growth in the fall. And then in November, uh, just before dormancy, we went out and took uh, foot deep soil samples and uh, we did that both in central Pennsylvania and up in up in Vermont. So it's pretty similar, I think, to uh, what uh, we found in others have found in Maryland here with a good rye cover crop or others have too. So we've, sim we've been able to uh, uh, accomplish what's possible in Maryland with rye cover crops in more northern environments. I'm going to add just one point to that. So, I mean, the big thing also there is that just when you hit black layer with corn, you got a lot of time between when that corn is drying and you can harvest it. So that's kind of the real big action zone between when you've got a cover crop that's post-harvest drilled versus when it's interseeded. So yeah, when it's interseeded, it might not be doing that well while it's hunkering down underneath that corn. But as soon as those leaves brown down and it's drying down, you've got several weeks there where it's drying and there's nothing out there unless you've interceded. So that's, that's kind of some of the biggest part of that action zone is the difference in nitrogen. The question is, you mentioned about uh, 90 pounds of nitrogen that produced close to 200 pounds of, uh, 200 bushels of uh, corn. Did you put right. any other nitrogen trials there? Any other treatment? No. And that one particular one, it was, it, no, we didn't. We only used one nitrogen rate. And that was from uh, somebody, I mean, that c came from the soil test? the rate that you applied? The rate was just a fertilizer that we applied. Yeah, and that was the recommended rate, right? That was um, perhaps lower than what, what would normally be recommended because we had one ton, so that's about 2,000 pounds of, uh, we had 2,000 pounds of hairy veg, typically contains 4% um, nitrogen. So 4% of uh, 2,000 would be about 80 pounds, I guess. Is that correct? Uh, we've got to do some math here and on the fly. But uh, you typically assume that 50% only of that you can count on as kind of fertilizer nitrogen value. So we actually applied less than what we would normally recommend. But uh, it, that it works very well. Most of the notable farmers don't apply the recommended rate from the universities because no-till don't have their own uh, 
recommendation. So, uh, well, the interesting thing about that is that many people still believe that you have to plow the, the hairy vetch under to get the nitrogen benefit. But in our research, we see that in our, in, in our climate, um, just leaving it on the soil surface gave us very, we didn't see that the, the incorporation really increased the nitrogen value. So have you checked out the amount of ni available nitrogen uh, before planting? I might, because there might be a big difference between your conventional and your no-till and your uh, planting green treatment, right? Mm -hmm. So is, is there was a big difference in uh, organic matter, available nitrogen, something like that? So because 90, 90 pounds of nitrogen produced 200 bushel of <laughs> yeah. corn make a big difference. Yes, and that must be coming from the nitrogen must be coming from somewhere, right? Right, from the cover crop and from the soil. Yeah, but I don't think we did the PSNT this uh, for this particular year. But we um, also sometimes the PSNT. Uh, recommendations are also very uh, valuable, uh, variable. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say about it. It just worked. Do you have some other comments, this, Greg? Also, this field doesn't normally get 200 bushels to the acre, I would say. Well, we never had, we ne really never have harvested 200 bushels ever before. So, no. one, one thing I found, and I'm sure it's working here is that we, where we had great conditions over the summer uh, for long season mineralization of nitrogen from our soils, especially many of the no-till soils in our area in central Pennsylvania, they produced uh, a, a lot of corn for the amount of nitrogen that was applied. And, uh, I, and one experience I had was that I used the ADAPT-N model. Some of you are familiar with that. And uh, it told me in July 30th, the corn was uh, uh, beautiful. Uh, it said, you know what, the uh, soil nitrate out in your field, Greg, is one part per million. And I said, baloney. <laughs> the guys from Cornell don't know what they're doing. I, went, I took some soils. <laughs> that's, ac that's actually the first time I've ever said that, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, and I, I took soil tests and went back to the lab. And it came, I had two fields that came back one and two parts per million. So these great crops, they drew the uh, mineral soil nitrate down. And then in, in August, that uh, those soils were, were releasing enough nitrogen to carry them through the uh, rest of the season. That's where I think, I think in years where we really have to tap on the soil, that's where your soil health can uh, uh, really contribute to exceptional yields. This is one I, I just wanted to add one little point on. A lot of times we hear this, right? That that you 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 know you, I applied 90 pounds of fertilizer and I got 200 bushel corn, and and how did that happen? And and everything that you just heard is exactly the case, right? That you build up this soil mineralization potential and that nitrogen that you build up over time, and and that soil is is a buffer. And so that's very common in long history of no-till cover crops or manure use that you have that reserve. But I, I think it's important to note because there is a lot of there's a lot of folks going around the country and all of a sudden saying, well, you don't need to fertilize anymore. Stop fertilizing. And they're telling farmers to stop fertilizing. And I, I think we need to be very careful with that kind of language. There's a one thing that goes into building up those soil reserves. There's another thing in mining it. And so, you know, just as you built up those soil reserves over time, they're there as a buffer. They, they absolutely. And we have plenty of examples of growing 120 to 150 bushels of corn with no cover crop and no fertilizer. And that's just because they built up those base soil fertility levels. But if you keep mining that year after year, you're not going to have that result. So this is, this is a balancing act of maintaining that, those soil reserves with both adding new carbon amendments. Yeah, I've got a question for Greg, and it's about crop insurance. So as you probably know, when the NRCS termination guidelines came out a couple of years ago, they did not allow interseeding, but then they were changed to allow interseeding if agronomic management is not affected. So my question is, uh, given that that's the national guidelines, sometimes things get interpreted differently at the local level. So are the farmers that you've been selling equipment to, the interseeder, 
running into any crop insurance issues that you're aware of? We, ha I ha we haven't heard of any. And I know in Pennsylvania we have pretty solid footing. And I also know at the agronomy meetings, our, uh, uh, the Iowa Practical Farmers had uh, addressed the same issue. And they went back in the literature and looked at the yield impacts. And uh, they must have been and pulling together data as I had done for our uh, crop insurance people. I, I make the analogy, and I haven't been in, involved in the argument uh, this time around, but uh, when we started no-tilling back in the day, uh, uh, that wasn't exactly the, you know, there was a lot of yield uh, impacts back then with the kind of equipment we operated with, yet that was a, a practice that wasn't really scrutinized by uh, crop insurance. So that's a little bit of a precedent for something that is out front there a little bit that may occasionally impact but have long-term benefits. Mm -hmm.